Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 227. Persistence guarantees that results are inevitable. Paran Hansa Yogananda. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Known is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley ADR and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. So today on the show, we have a treat for you guys. We have an absolute bona fide, certified YouTube guru. His name is Christopher Sharp, and uh, he's a good buddy of mine. And we've been, I've been like picking his brain about YouTube now for months. And he actually wrote a book called YouTube Black Book, how to create a channel, build an audience and make money on YouTube. And he has definitely been able to do all of that. He is currently the, uh, co-founder of Yoga with Adrian. And if you just go to YouTube and type the word yoga, he is the first, I think, seven out of 10 videos you'll see. He has over 3 million followers on uh, Yoga by Adrian. And before that, he built up a whole channel with him. his wife. It wasn't his wife at the beginning, but his soon-to-be wife. Uh, and it's called Hilda's Kitchen. And built up a whole cooking channel on YouTube. Now, Chris is a filmmaker, indie filmmaker, and he decided to jump into this space because he saw an opportunity, and he started building content for the YouTube space. Now, he discusses, uh, in this interview, we're going to discuss how he's able to monetize, not only on YouTube, because honestly, the money that you make on YouTube, it's kind of like bonus money. It's all the ancillary things that he does, how he's able to uh, build out product lines f- and feed the audience, the rabid audience that follows his um his his content and he really discusses and shows us how he was able to build out uh, a mini empire on a, a YouTube empire by building out these different ancillary uh, revenue streams as well as building out um, creating the content that they want. How do you get your your videos ranked? How do you know what your audience wants? Little tricks of the trade like that, and it is just a plum full episode. Of amazing stuff. So if you want to know anything about YouTube, how to build up a channel, and this goes for all filmmakers too, filmmakers who are just going to be putting up their trailers, their their production company, their own director's stuff, everything we're going to be talking about in this episode also is for you. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Christopher Sharp. I'd like to welcome to the show Christopher Sharp, brother. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. Thanks for having me. I've been a fan of the show for a long time, so it's an honor to be on. It's an honor that you are a fan, sir. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, I wanted to bring you on because there's so many filmmakers trying to figure out how to make a living in the film industry and kind of build up an empire and doing what they love to do. And you have been able to do that in spades. So I wanted to kind of bring you on the show and pick your brain. So f- before we get started, man, how did you even get into this business? 
Well, it's interesting and particularly for your audience in that I actually got into this business because I failed at the indie film business. Uh, I'd, I'd worked on short films um, after college, directed a lot of commercials, music videos, that type of thing, and had finally done my first feature. That did pretty well. This was back in the days when DVD was still strong. So we got a home video distribution deal and it was pretty exciting. I spent the next year or so putting together money for a follow-up feature, but this was like 2008, right when everything fell out of the economy. So that ended up kind of going upside down. We got like 80% of the movie shot and uh, it kind of fell apart because of the financing and left me as you know, realizing that this wasn't going to be viable for me to go forward <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and count on making a living from indie films at that time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I moved back in with my mom for a few months and trained myself on how to do websites and search engine optimization and that type of thing. Moved back to Austin, got a job, super boring, stable job with insurance. And I was like, okay, this is taken care of, but I still want to be making stuff. So what can I make that doesn't, require me to get producers money and what can I do cheap? So I got together with one of my friends that we'd worked on sketch comedy videos together. She was a great cook and super funny. Her name was Hyla and we started the Hyla cooking channel, which was a instructional cooking channel. And, um, I was able to put together all of my filmmaking stuff with all the nerd stuff that I'd learned about the internet and search engine optimization and get this channel going. And, and cooking, cooking channels on YouTube, Pretty intense competition, I would say. It was a little easier back then. I would say there was maybe t- 10 serious cooking channels so at that, the time. So, what, it was, what year are we talking about? This was 2010, okay. 2011. Yeah, okay. 2011. So, so YouTube it was, was, it's just starting to get, it, it wasn't starting to become a thing, but I think Google had already purchased them at that point. Yeah. And it was, they, they had just, started the partner program like maybe a year before that. And it was still, you had to apply and everything Mm -hmm. and, and to, to do monetization. So we didn't even have things monetized at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to like build an audience because we thought we could potentially sell it as a TV show later. You know, if we had a, if we had proven that we had an audience and people were into it, we could just go to food network or something, which is what our thinking was at the time. So yeah. So you didn't see a master plan of how you can build an online empire with all of this kind of stuff going on. You were still thinking traditional, but you were using this as a tool to build the, you know, go down a traditional path. Yeah. We wanted to show people what we could do, but I also felt like we could build a substantial audience. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that hadn't been done that much at that time. So it seemed like, yeah, I didn't have the master plan for what we have now that just kind of came in bits and pieces as we tried to figure out how to turn it into an actual business. Right. You're learning along the way. Cause it's kind of mm-hmm. like wild, wild west. Pretty much. Yeah. It still is in a lot of ways. It's changing fast, man. I have to <laughs> get up and, and read the news every day to figure <laughs> out uh, how, you know, what's what to plan for next. So remember the days where you could just like, you know, just do the same thing for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and well, that, those, like, those days are over, man. And and <laughs> it was kind of like I had to get out of that mindset to yep. be successful, really. Now, you um, when we talked before, you were talking about how you actually started getting some videos ranked and what sure. your content plan was for uh, for Hyla's cooking. So how did you how did you even pick what you were going to start doing? So yeah, we didn't have any money for advertising or anything else. We literally just started it with like one video camera mm-hmm. and a lamp from Target and a shower curtain mm-hmm. and a twenty two dollar wireless lavalier. Mm-hmm. So she was wired actually. So we had no money to promote. So since, you know, during my time trying to re-educate myself to get a job, I'd learned about search engine optimization. So I was like, okay, what if we use, what if we build our videos around things people are actually searching for so that we can build an audience that way and not have to pay. So I did some keyword research and just targeted a few hundred recipe, food and related topics that people that had a decent search volume. Mm -hmm. And then I printed out that list. Hyla and I got together and she checked off the ones that she was excited about. So we, so we started, so we weren't doing anything that was outside her skill set or interest Mm -hmm. or mine. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was things that we knew people were searching for. So we started the show with a list of 100 keywords that we were going to go after. And so when we would get ready to plan a shoot, we'd pick things off that list and build the episodes around those. So you were actually creating content for what people wanted. What a concept. It was a huge adjustment for me from that. That was maybe the biggest adjustment uh, change from being in the indie filmmaker mindset that I was in at the time Mm -hmm. to, okay, let's do this YouTube thing and let's 
figure, let's build an, let's, let's really focus on building an audience. So that was, that was a huge shift for me. So how did you, uh, and then obviously as, as the, the, the channel progressed and you started building it up little by little, it started to kind of build up steam. Uh, yep. and you started adjusting, I'm assuming at, on a daily basis, a weekly basis, depending on, uh, what you saw happening. Yeah. And, and after we'd been, you know, so we did it for a year, for a year with no income at all from it. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have monetization turned on and we just wanted this to be, we wanted this to get out to as many people as possible for the first year. And so we didn't, we weren't really focused on that. We both had jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we start, then, you know, the YouTube, the YouTube ecosystem has changed a lot. I mean, it's always changing, but at that time it was particularly changing fast in that there was a lot of brands coming in to sponsor videos and that was interesting to us. And then we won a few YouTube competitions and we were able to like, you know, which came with some upgraded equipment and stuff. So we were able to increase the quality of the show a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they, they're the ones that really encouraged us to turn on monetization because of course YouTube wants to show ads. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think, I feel like channels without ads turned on, um, possibly don't rank as well. This is kind of a conspiracy theory, but, Mm -hmm. uh, Based on my personal tests, it's proven to be true. So mm-hmm. we turned on ads, started to make a little bit of money, did some sponsorship deals, did an ebook. So we were just putting together these pieces, these different revenue streams. And then then we eventually started getting hired to produce shows for companies like Scripps, Food Network, and Tastemade for their digital platforms as they were all trying to figure that out. Mm-hmm. So we got paid to produce short series for for their digital platforms. And that was when we we're like, okay. We're too busy to go to work anymore. Let's just do this full time. And, and so we did. And that's how you got, and that's how you were able to start, you know, living the dream as they say. <laughs> yeah, but it was not, it, it, it wasn't income from one place ever. So even from the, from the beginning, I realized that we were going to need to build multiple revenue streams to, mm-hmm. to be able to count on the income mm-hmm. rather than, oh, we're getting, here's a, here's this amount of money to do this series. It's not something that you can really count on or, or make plans based on. Right. So that's something I want to kind of dive into a little bit is revenue streams. I've spoken Mm -hmm. so much on this show about multiple revenue streams off of projects and off of properties. And you've done this again in spades with, uh, with Hyla's cooking where, uh, can you just kind of lay down what were the revenue streams, the major revenue streams that came in, uh, and, and, and how that worked as, as far as your ecosystem was concerned? Yeah, so for Hilo Cooking, we, so we have the YouTube um, revenue stream mm-hmm. based on the ad, the ads that play before your YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. Then we started bringing out eBooks and eventually a print book, and it was all just done through Amazon, mm-hmm. you know, like the Kindle and then CreateSpace. So those started doing uh, really well for us. And then I think we've now produced five series for for other companies. So these are would be like ten to twelve episode series of videos. Sometimes they'll have a sponsor, sometimes they won't, but we would get paid based, we would get paid from the company and, you know, it's just a work for hire deal where we make a series for them. Mm -hmm. And then sponsorship in revenue, um, which was, you know, which is significant. If you, if you can build up to a, to a certain size and you have the demographics that that advertisers want can be lucrative as well. So it was really those, those were the the core, um, revenue streams for that. And that, and that basically put food on your, your table and kept you and kept you busy all the time where you didn't have to have a full-time job. Yep. Just not quite enough food. Not so, exactly. Well. You, you, <laughs> you you were you're eating just above ramen. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, but yeah, it was great because once you can once you have the thing that you're passionate about and you can work on it full time, it's I mean, it's hard for me to imagine anybody not you know dramatically increasing what they're doing. No, exactly. Especially when you start seeing something. And I found that with my world as well. When you start seeing something work, you want to put a little bit of gas on the fire. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Because we don't know. Like at the end of the day, nobody really knows anything. Uh, You don't know if anything's going to go viral. You don't, you know, you have a general idea of what things are going to do, especially in the YouTube world. Uh, But sometimes I'm assuming sometimes you thought something was going to hit and it didn't. And then sometimes you thought that's just a throwaway and it blows up. Is that correct? Totally. Yeah, totally. And it's, yeah, yeah. The idea that there's, you know, by the time there's a proven model for something, you know, like there's, there's people that are like, oh, here's a, here's a course on how to do Facebook advertising, or here's a course on how to optimize YouTube videos. By the time those techniques have gotten codified enough to like 
get into an internet marketing course, it's already time to be looking for the next thing. You know, you know right. what I mean? So it's like you have to like, if you're serious about this, I think you have to constantly be testing and experimenting to see what works. Cause sometimes, you know, it's like, um, we can get into the yoga with Adrian stuff we will um, yeah, too, but like, you know, like we wouldn't have imagined that our streaming video on demand service would have like totally changed that business. We were just kind of testing it and it, and it blew up. So yeah. So all you got to always be testing and trying new stuff and, and seeing how it lands. Now let's get into yoga with Adrian. Oh, but by the way, uh, uh Hila's cooking, how many subscribers last time I saw was like with almost 400,000. Yeah, it's about 400. It's yeah. We, we did that show for seven years and now we've officially ended the show, even though we occasionally make a new video, but mm-hmm. so it's, it's dropped a little bit, but it was at 400,000. And so it's kind of declined a little bit since we have no longer been publishing new videos on a regular basis. But off of that, all of that work, you still get a monthly revenue stream from yep. it. Yeah. And we still sell books and she still gets offers to do talent type projects, you know, where she would go be on camera for a, for a cooking project. So, so and it's great. It's, it's got her on chopped and Kelly Ripa and food network and all these things like that. So it's been, it's been, it's been great. And it continues to be great. So that's the thing that people understand. If, if uh, listeners have to understand is like, let's say you put in, you know, seven years of work, uh, into something. And it's like, mm-hmm. when you turn it off, you're like, I'm not going to do it anymore. The revenue doesn't stop. It keeps, no, it's slow. It, yeah. It's some, I mean, like depending on the month, sometimes it's still as big as it ever was, you know, I mean, overall, overall, I would say there's been a slight decline in revenue, but, but it's something uh, for, for doing yeah. no more work. Like it's, it's work yeah. off residuals. It's, it's residuals. Basically <laughs> it's, it's basically residuals. It's like, uh, what do they call it? Mailbox money. Uh, yeah. it just kind of shows up. Um, and that's the business model of, I think the future as opposed to just creating just one product and that's it. You sell it and, and that's all, um, yep. It just keeps, keeps going and keeps going. So let's jump into yoga with Adrian, which, uh, you know, when, when we met, I was like, yoga? And you <laughs> you were like, yeah, I don't know, man. Because <laughs> I'm like, you don't seem the yoga type. He's like, so how did, how did yoga with Adrian come to be? So Adrian was another actor in the failed movie that I mentioned earlier. So it was kind of like that. We, we got to, we got to know each other in this like trial by fire type type situation. And, um, I knew she was a yoga teacher and the highlight cooking channel had gotten to a certain point where I wanted to use the same kind of like template for the business, but do it in a different area. So I knew yoga, I knew yoga was huge. You know, it's a massive, massive industry. Mm-hmm. And I knew Adrian had a, a unique take on it. I knew she was great on camera and I wanted to work with her some more. So I, so I p- pitched her the idea and she was into it. It took us about a year to get it started. And then we just started making videos. And even with that one, we didn't really have a, like I knew I wanted to build the channel, but I, I didn't really have an idea for revenue beyond what we would make from YouTube or sponsorships. Mm -hmm. So we just like concentrated on making the best videos that we could and building an audience for it. And that audience has really become a amazing community of people that's built up around the show and that's changed everything for us. So, um, so we, you know, it's like, we still, we still have ads on YouTube for ranking reasons, but Mm -hmm. the majority of our, uh, revenue comes from, our uh, streaming video on demand service. So it's like, it's like exclusive videos that you can access through your phone or your T- Apple TV or your Roku or whatever. And people subscribe for nine ninety nine a month. And that's how we do everything else that we do. So with, and, and you talk about a, a community, your community now is getting close to 3 million, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. So that's our, so, so we've got, cl- yeah, I think we should hit 3 million subscribers by the end of the year on the YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And then, um, like those are our, those, those are our, co- that's our, our audience. But mm-hmm. then as they get involved in some of our private communities, that's, that's when we consider them like part, they're like more invested and they're like part of the community and they're interacting with each other and all that kind of stuff. And so that's probably about 30 to 40,000 people right now. I'd have to tally that up. <sighs> that's amazing. So, but so the, the other thing is, and, and and that's what I found so fascinating about your story, is that you guys went after yoga, which mm-hmm. is a fairly competitive, <laughs> broad term. It's yeah, it, it's it's insanely competitive, uh, actually, because it's it's a it's a sub niche of 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 health and wealth, uh, health health and fitness. Uh, right. But you guys own the term yoga. <laughs> 
on YouTube. For like, now, man. Every every time I have this conversation, I have, feel like I have to. Uh, oh, I, log, gotta, I have to look check it check it out in, in YouTube. But yeah, last time I checked, we were pretty pretty strong on the on the top results for yoga. Yeah, you're like I think you think like you're seven out of the top ten videos. Um, and the top five are all you guys, which is is massive. It is a massive feat. So how there are some tricks you do. I don't know how much you want to reveal. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But I'll how, talk talk this stuff all day. I don't have any secrets. Yeah. So how <laughs> no, so how do you how do you like go after a, such a major key a keyword like yoga and and rank at? I know it didn't happen overnight, but how do you do it? Like what's, well, what what so, are some techniques? Yeah. So I I think it's also important to realize that uh, even though yoga is a niche of health and fitness and wellness, we specifically go after yoga for the at home yoga, like we're trying to give people the tools to have an at home yoga practice so they don't have to go to a studio or that type of thing. So we're kind of a niche of a niche of a niche. Um, so what we did, uh, we weren't ranking for anything for a long time. It was like all the big brands, Jillian Michaels, all, all this stuff, uh, outranked us for everything. So we started, you know, I did more keyword research, and I knew that yoga for weight loss would be a good one to go after. Yep. Uh, there was a, a ton of volume for that. And that's a weird one. We had to have a lot of discussions about that one because calling something yoga for weight loss is a little for, – for the yoga space, it's a little – it's not, it's not – yeah, it's a little spammy. It's not quite delicate enough, I guess, uh, <laughs> as, we, as we would like to use for most of our messaging and stuff. So we had to have a lot of conversations about that. And ultimately, it came down to like, okay, well, if we can expose a lot more people – to these videos, then it's worth using, it's worth going after yoga for weight loss and, and putting that in the title. So we did a series of videos, which is our yoga for weight loss series to go after that keyword. Mm -hmm. So once, and that was like a hard fight, man, that was really hard to move past, um, the, the people that were ranked for that already. But once we were able to rank for that, it kind of, op you know, that is really what turned the tables on it on every it's what changed everything so so we started getting a substantial amount of traffic for that and then we picked other uh, things like morning yoga yoga for beginners mm -hmm. things like that 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 we knew that there was a uh, search volume for and then we started just like on a micro level going after those so as we started to rank higher for each of the individual keywords it just kind of amassed um our overall you know our overall traffic grew and it started to look like it was it started to look like there was some potential there, but once again, there was two years of yoga yeah. with Adrian, absolutely no revenue. So there was, so this was, it actually took you longer to get. It did. It was, it was, it was a hard, it was a hard one. And, and you know, it was, it was just, it, I, I didn't know even I, there were, there were times that I didn't think it was going to be possible, but we did it. It was just like chip, chipping away. I was very determined. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you do again, what I, I preach about a lot, which is like, you look at the long game because mm -hmm. people go, oh, I've been doing this for six months. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm like, well, it doesn't work in six months. It right. takes a year, two years. And you were going after a fairly big fish, you know, yeah. uh, you know, cooking a uh, high level cooking was at, in a different time, less competition. If you would start a cooking channel today, it would probably be, it's just insane. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, it's like, there's definitely, you know, I think it's good to go into a competitive market, but it's not good to go into a oversaturated market and cooking and recipes. I tend to think is oversaturated. <laughs> <You think>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's on my experience. You know, I don't want to discourage anybody from doing what they want to do, but I'm like, that's going to be a hard one because even the big companies, um, their videos aren't doing so good anymore in that space. So right. it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, so can we talk a little bit about the ecosystem? Cause you have an insane ecosystem you've created with yoga with Adrian. So sure. as far as the revenue streams and, and projects and things like that, that you're doing with, with yoga with Adrian. Sure. So like as far as revenue streams, you know, we have the YouTube, you know, the, what we make from YouTube ads, we do a few sponsorships and partnerships like um, Adidas is one of our partners that we love a lot right now just mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a great fit. What they're doing is a great fit for us. So it's not necessarily just about the money. It's mm -hmm. about oh, like being in with Adidas helps us move our message more. That's, that's really the most important thing about that one. And we really like working with them. So it's like, yeah, so YouTube revenue, um, sponsorships. We have a t-shirt store. So we do t-shirts and other like physical merchandise. Mm -hmm. And then we sell 
courses on a transactional basis. So it's like you get a course, a calendar, an ebook, these exclusive videos that aren't on the YouTube channel mm-hmm. and access to a private community for like encouragement and accountability. Um, so that's, that's how people like really start getting into our, the community side of things. And then we have our SVOD or streaming video on demand service, which is kind of like Netflix for yoga. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I mentioned earlier that you can access, you know, from TVs and phones and how, mu- how much content do you have in your streaming service now? Dude, that's a great question. I have someone, <laughs> I have someone like adding up all the hours right now, but it's, yeah. it's a lot. It's hundreds of videos and over 50 now that are exclusive to the, to the streaming video service. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we're, and we're really ramping that up next year. So we'll have, in addition to a new video every week, on the YouTube channel, we'll have new content every week in the membership. Now, let me ask you a question: are, are, Do you the, because the brand is so connected to Adrian, um, so it's not like you know a big a, a big brand, uh, another <laughs> like a nameless brand, if you will, but it has you know yoga with Adrian. Will you ever venture out into creating content with other um, other yoga instructors, other content that you would put into the streaming service, or is everything so specific to Adrian? Well, yeah, we're going to be expanding that because one of the one of the things that has come out of the community is this um, concept of find what feels good, and that's like really what separates our yoga from other yogas, uh, other other yoga teachers. Mm-hmm. In that, it's not super strict. It's about what's finding that works for you and your body. Mm-hmm. Because like we ha- we have a, we have a very different community around this than than you would find in other than you would find with other yoga teachers or other yoga brands. Mm-hmm. So we're very very specific into that. So find what feels good is our umbrella brand and that's actually the name of the SVOD service. It's findwhatfeelsgood.com mm-hmm. or fwfg.com. Mm-hmm. So next year we'll start having Adrian introduce these other teachers that have influenced her and, or that, and that she's learned a lot from she could because she wants to work with other teachers so that she can learn in addition to getting content for our community, but yeah, we will bring in, we will be bringing in some cool people that I think are all really fresh. They, they, I don't think they've been seen in in yoga videos yet. So the can you talk a little bit about community and and building mm-hmm. that community because you have a, a very uh, interesting culture within mm-hmm. your community. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you do to kind of engage with your community, build a community, the relationship? that you have with your community because it's all the entire empire is all reliant on this concept of being able to connect with people on a human level and in a community, give them something that they're looking for that they're not finding anywhere else. So how do you, what, what can you give us as far as tips are concerned on how you're able to build and maintain this relationship in such a noisy world? Yeah, it's that's a great question and I'm not sure I have an easy takeaway answer for that, mm-hmm. but it's it started very so we we first started our um a private Facebook group um in conjunction with our first course that we sold. It was called Reboot and it was designed to start in January, you know, it was designed to last over the month of January. So we promoted it. We were like we didn't know how it was going to do, but we we sold this course that was videos and a calendar and an ebook, and then we at the last minute we decided oh we need to like add something else to this. It seems like it's too expensive or something, so we added a private Facebook community. So that was how it really started, and that's actually what really caused things to grow, in my opinion. So it was just a private space for everyone to talk about how they were doing as they went through this, this yoga program and they started talking to each other. And then when we saw how that started to work, we became very focused on, okay, this is, how do we serve this community that's already growing here? How do we give them, like, how do we feed that community? How do, you know, it's just, just basically almost like you would people. I mean, it is similar to how you would cultivate a community in real life. We just, we just tried to encourage that communication and then we would use uh, what we were hearing in the community. We would use that feedback to actually make the, our next batches of videos and, you know, we would see what they wanted us to make. So like the, the next big request was for a yoga plus high intensity interval training type course. Mm-hmm. So we, we did that and then um, it continued to grow from there. But now, and even f- so we have a community manager now and that's someone that was very active in the community from the beginning. So she's like now on full time as like a community manager, listening to the community and helping us to, it's easy to, to 
just just get concentrated on all this new stuff that you're making and throwing out there. But now like our messaging, we all, all the messaging, whether it's through email or how we're going to promote something or when we're going to announce a live event, um, it's filtered through it's filtered with that community in mind and serving that community because mm-hmm. I feel like if we continue to take care of that, I mean, that's the most important part of the business, honestly. Mm-hmm. So as long as we continue to cultivate that and like care for those people, uh, I think we'll, yeah, everything else kind of takes care of itself. It's kind of a very different mindset of, of what independent filmmakers do because <clears throat> in a lot of ways they just make a product sometimes mm-hmm. for themselves and they hope to go find an audience for it. And it's a one-off. Right. It's mm-hmm. generally not something you keep, you know, feeding. Uh, mm-hmm. This is a completely different mindset. Uh, and I've kind of learned a little bit about that through Indie Film Hustle. But it, it, it's, it's just such a different um, way of looking at content creating and, and what you can create with that as far as your revenues are concerned, as far as communities. And you're actually, you know, we're talking about the business side of this, but you're helping mm-hmm. people. You're like literally I know, helping and it, people. Yeah, and and that's what. The, so none of the stuff that we're doing now, I I, I couldn't have anticipated any of it. Mm-hmm. It was really like listening and responding. And some of these stories, like we have people that have because we we really try to design um, our YouTube channel so that it attracts people that may never go to a yoga class for whatever reason. It's expensive. They don't feel like they can do it. Maybe they have body image issues, like those type of people. And those are the people that we bring in gently. You know, it's, there's all these free videos for them to build a home practice with. And then eventually they get involved in the community. But we've seen people that had serious health problems that had trouble even walking. And they started doing these videos. And now some of those people are yoga teachers. So we've been able to like follow them on their journey. So this is like, this is actually kind of, I like, I never would have anticipated that I would be involved in something like this because I'm, I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the, uh, bad guy and, you know, behind the scenes, not, not bad, but like, I'm kind of the one that's always like pushing, you know, traditionally I've been the one that's pushing to like build this into a business and Adrian's the yogi that's out balancing me out. But now (laughs) I've, I'm kind of on that side too, where it's like the most important thing to me is that we do actually like serve this community because it's become important all around. And, and I mean, the one thing that people have to understand who are listening is you have to create value for your audience, whatever sure. that value might be. It could be, it could be humor. It could be education. It could be inspiration. Right. Uh, and and, and but, we try to get all those. Yeah. I mean, if you can get all of them, then you're gold. Then you're in the, you got the trifecta because you've got everything all together. I try to do the same thing with uh, indie film hustle. And you know, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, but, uh, even in the two years that I've been doing indie film hustle and and building up the tribe and and everything, it's it's been very educational to me about how you you talk to your community, how you build your community, how you serve your community. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the big place where a lot of a lot of people make the mistake is they don't they thinking about money, 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 and it's not about that. It's about serving, and money will come once you serve. Well, it, along those lines, and one of the things that I that I didn't mention earlier when I talked about our different revenue streams, because it's turned out to not be in revenue streams, it's turned out to kind of be a break even stream or lose a little money stream is our uh, live event. So yeah. we just we just finished a big tour, and tour, touring is different. You know, it's a totally different deal, and it, it, it's just <laughs> like it's just really hard, especially when you're going across the country with merchandise and all this kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot of logistics and I think we did an awesome job on it. But when the tour, we know that it's going to be, we know when we, when we do live events or when we do a tour, um, and for various reasons, a live event is different in yoga. You can fit a lot less people into a venue because of the mats and all this kind of stuff. So, so it's logistically tricky, but we don't really do that because, uh, you know, it'd be nice if we, it'd be nice if it became a reliable revenue stream, but it's really there to serve the community because when we get people together in these live events, they're meeting in real life, all these people that they have connected with online and it becomes a totally different thing. And that sends that, that creates even more momentum, Mm -hmm. but even better than that on this tour, uh, we hadn't done merchandise at a tour before. And I really wanted to work the merchandise table as much as possible Mm -hmm. so that I could make sure all of our, you know, like square readers and stuff were working. But, Mm -hmm. but most importantly, so that I could have like these, lots of conversations with a lot of people as they were coming through and to get ideas for what people really wanted for our next batch of merchandise. So they, and it t- so listening to all those people as they came through at the merchandise table and getting their feedback on the products and 
what they would like to see changed our direction for our, our upcoming physical products as well. So like listening, man, it's like, it's, it's like the most important thing. And you could do the same thing in a lot of ways when you're trying to create an independent film or a series, you can Mm -hmm. talk to an audience and go, Hey, I'm thinking about making a movie about this. What would you like to see in it? And, and kind of build up that community around you making a movie. Yeah. Uh, And I've seen that happen many times where it, it works out very, very well. Now, if you were going to start a YouTube channel today, a brand new one, Mm -hmm. how would you go about it? (laughs) Well, can you give me a subject? That's the question. So first things first, you got to find. First things first, you got to decide what you're going to do. And it should be a balance of, I mean, it should be like, it's going to be a grind. So it's got to be something that you're actually into. If you're going to be, you know, if you're behind the scenes producing or if you're on camera, either way, Mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of, um, you know. There's going to be a lot of grinding, grinding away. So you got to you got to be prepared to at least like edit those videos on a on a weekly basis and um, love and love what you're doing. Yeah, and yeah. Love, so you, yeah, because if you're all of a sudden you're like the hand sanitizer guy, <laughs> you're making a, right. You're not going and you don't right. love hand sanitizer. This is a problem. Exactly. So and I think you know, obviously we're in a much more fragmented space now with everything. So people aren't you know there's not that many mass media things anymore that everybody's watching people are going like more and more it's more and more fragmented so people are looking for stuff that's much more targeted so like even yeah yeah yeah, even with um you know even if you're going to make a movie or you're going to make a series i think that there's ways to dig into that like say you're going to make a series about um you know, yeah, I don't know. A vegan. <laughs> a se- I always use this example a, a series about a vegan chef. A vegan chef, which is great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is a great example. So then you would want to like, because like you, you may think that veganism is, you know, so w- within veganism, there's several sub niches within that. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. So you may want, so I, I would like to, I always recommend going to the most narrow niche that you can dominate. <laughs> and because mm-hmm. that's pretty easy, but it may be small, but then that gives you a little bit of momentum to like start expanding it out. Cause if it's a, if it's about a vegan chef, you know, it's probably, there's going to be vegetarians that are interested in it as well. Um, and but then it's like a you raw have, vegan chef. Yeah. Ah. Then you got the whole, so like to go into these like sub subsets, you know, sure. the sub sub niches and start creating content to capture those people. And like, okay, well yeah, I've only, I'm only like my, my audience in this sub niche is like, 5,000 people will get those people and then you can expand from there and start. And, and I, I still am a big believer in search engine optimization. So I do look for what people are searching. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's easy ways to do that. Like you can even um, go to just the, the search bar at the top of YouTube and I'm looking up like vegan and it starts filling in. So like I type in vegan and I see vegan gains, vegan recipes, vegan Thanksgiving, vegan meal prep, vegan, what I eat in a day. That'd be a great one to go after first. Vegan Mm -hmm. breakfast, that'd be another great one to go after. Mm -hmm. So you could go after these little things and incorporate the story of the movie that you're making with some actual useful, entertaining content while you go. Mm-hmm. It's a whole, it's a whole other world, isn't it? It's a brand new world. Yeah. (laughs) But people are searching for this stuff. People are searching for very, you know, everything is becoming much more specific, I think. Right. It's it, Everything's about – you're right. It's fragmented. It's all niche. I mean, back in the day when, you know, MASH and Cheers mm-hmm. finales were like, you know, 50 million people, 70 million people, 100 million people, uh, that was because there was nothing else. Yeah. And it's like that just doesn't – yeah, if you think of – man, it's I was just thinking about this yesterday of how few shows and movies were produced just like back when we were kids. Yeah. You know, there yeah. was like – Hardly, and then you compare it now. There's probably 500 you know, scripted shows on television today. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost impossible to, to keep up. But they're very, you know, those scripted shows are, especially on Netflix, they're targeting very specific demographics. And they so, and they don't really care about advertisers with that in that model, so they can be a little bit really, really be niche and go farther than other places uh, that other channels like the network channels that do. Totally. It's and, and I, I come at this from a very working class background you mm-hmm. know so i'm like i'm not expecting to uh knock one out of the park i just want to keep working 
<laughs> yeah, and that's the other, and that's yeah. the other thing that filmmakers and, and people listening should understand that this is not about get rich quick. It's not like you're rolling around in a Rolls Royce living in the Hollywood Hills, you right. know. But uh, but you but you're able to make a living, uh, hi, you know, g- keep a staff of people working for you, mm-hmm. and work and do what you love to do and continue to build and build and build. To and you're just building up a company and, and building up right. multiple companies doing this, but. It's not about like I'm, you know, in a year from now I'm going to be millions and millions. And like, no, it it yeah. doesn't work like that. It just doesn't. Uh, there Unless are, you already have a few million to throw at advertising, then all that's this a stuff. whole. Then that's <laughs> a, a whole, whole different other, ballgame. But like, a, yeah, we're we're working our way up, so. and, and we're and we're both coming from a place of the street, if you will. Like mm-hmm. we started with nothing, and just yep. kind of grinded and clawed our way up in our pers- in our respective arenas. Uh, Definitely. And continue to do so on a daily basis. Yeah, I don't see that ending because yeah. this is all this is all changing. Everything's changing every day. So right, yeah. exactly. Uh, and, and even in that's the other thing. Even these big brands who have tons of cash, they can't make headway. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah, sure like, I was that. just reading about like Tube Filter just laid off a bunch of. I mean, uh, not Tube Filter, but uh, Full Screen just laid off a bunch of people and closed down their SVOD service. So like, if and they've got a ton of money. It's not about money. It's it's you've got to you kind of have to build a better mousetrap. And I think it's about legitimate connection yep. with your audience yep. is so huge, particularly on YouTube. Like I like I knew Hyla and Adrian would be um, I knew people would like them, but I knew that we could build a format that a, a show format that really facilitated that audience to host connection. Mm-hmm. And it's it's amazing because, you know, people spend so many hours hours and hours like watching these videos so when they 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 really feel like they know them Mm -hmm. like the audience really feels like they know them so there's like a connection there that's incredibly important on youtube i think now you also you also started creating i know with hyla and with uh, i think you as well with your own brand now you you've ventured out into podcasting Mm -hmm. and into other uh platforms as well to get the message out so youtube was a starting point for you like podcasting was a starting point for me and then as the audience builds, you're like, let me go, let me go find more, you know, another a bit, you know, more people or build mm-hmm. my audience on other platforms. And Definitely. That's, that's something, is that part of your strategy, I'm assuming? Yeah. And it's something to, you know, like the, my, like my audio and video podcast, you know, that's kind of an experiment in podcasting. There's not really like a business goal on that one. I just love talking to people about video and I love like helping people <laughs> with their, with their channels and stuff. So uh, there's not like a real business strategy behind that one, but yeah. So, we, so we do have Hyla's podcast, which has continued to, you know, continue that relationship with her audience potentially on a deeper level. And it's allowed her to do things that are not, you know, after seven years of a cooking video every week, at least, you can get a little burned out. And so she, she wanted to like talk about other stuff. So, and her audience has followed her over there and it's very successful. And then we'll be starting a new, um, podcast, um, with Adrian as the host in 2018. And that one's going to be really interesting because it lets us, it's not instructional content anymore, but it, once again, it allows her to talk to some of the people that she wants to learn from, talk to some big names and kind of expand it a little bit. Mm-hmm. to topics that are related to yoga and that world, but not actual, here's how to do yoga. Got it. So yeah, we will be, we'll be doing that as well. Well, yeah, it would be the equivalent of, of, you know, me starting a, I'm going to talk about movies instead of yep. educating people about mm-hmm. the making of movies. I'm like, Hey, this week we're just going to talk about the justice league and, yeah. and why it only made $5. No. I- <laughs> <laughs> um, now what is the biggest mistake uh, new YouTubers make, in your opinion? Um, not, not designing a show that you can produce on at least a weekly basis. So, because so consistency is like super important. So, a lot of times people just over engineer their their format so that it's almost impossible to produce on a weekly basis. So, I like to encourage people to start with a minimum viable show. You know, in that mm-hmm. they keep their format really simple so that you can at least get those videos out every week at the same time every week to start building that momentum with the algorithm. Mm-hmm. That's, now, that'd be the big one. Now you were, you were talking about um, momentum and, con- and and consistency. Can you please elaborate for people who don't know? I know you and I both know it, but uh, that how creating content, a certain amount of content every week and being religious to it every week mm-hmm. is so important in the YouTube world. 
Yeah, it's important because your audience comes to expect, you know, people people are super into YouTube and they expect their the people that they follow to have stuff out on a regular basis. So it's one one part is just like living up to like your audience expectations because we're still kind of in this world where we expect shows to come out once a week or whatever. And then um also you know, Google has this algorithm that control that, that they use. It's actually like an artificial intelligence now thing called the Google brain. And so that's how they decide what they're going to show in search results, but also in suggested videos and different things like that. So you kind of have to put in some time getting the algorithm used to what you're doing. And so that they can start, so they, they realize that, Oh, they're kind of expecting those shows, um, those videos on a regular basis. And then they send them out to your subscribers and put them in the supported, you know, in the recommended videos and in the search results. So the longer you're in the system, you're kind of like leveling up in the algorithm as long as you're doing it, you know, as long as you're not doing shady stuff. So the consistent schedule really helps that algorithm to understand what you're doing and start recommending your videos to more people. So can we just, can you discuss a little bit about how YouTube's algorithm looks at your channel and individual videos? Yeah, a little bit because the YouTube algorithm is super, super mysterious. Even when you're talking to people at YouTube, uh, they won't tell you too much. And it almost seems like they don't really know either. Like it's just like these engineers know. But I know that there's like several key factors. Um, One, it looks at your individual videos. So the first 48 to 72 hours are super important. So that's when it hasn't. YouTube, the algorithm hasn't seen how your how people are reacting to your video yet. It doesn't have enough data, mm-hmm. so it's looking at your title, your description, your tags, and if you want to like if you want to accelerate this process, I would have your videos professionally uh, transcribed and upload the transcript. So then it then it has the accurate text of your video to actually read in mm-hmm. the first that super important window right after you launch. Mm-hmm. So it looks at that. So it's going to start ranking your videos based on all that stuff that you put in, in the, in the captions. But then it also look, takes into account the rest of your channel. So that's why it's hard in the beginning because you don't have very many videos. You don't have very many subscribers and you don't have very much watch time on your channel. Mm-hmm. So in all honesty, it's much easier for me to rank for yoga terms now because we have just so so many people watching the videos, and we've got almost three million subscribers. So it's kind of vetted, I guess. You're you know, an authority. Know. You're an authority yeah, according yeah. to Google. Mm-hmm. So there's that, and then it also takes into account like how much time people are watching your videos. So that's what we would consider watch time. So they've recently changed the metrics from views to watch time. You know that that's what they're. You can even see this in the analytics. They prioritize watch time over views. So that's like how much how many minutes of time, you know, how much time people are watching your channel, then you also get a little bit of a boost from say someone starts watching videos on the indie film hustle channel. Then they jump, then they follow a link to another channel and they're watching a video that you've recommended there. You still get some credit for that as far as like session duration. Mm -hmm. So YouTube is just rewarding your channel and your videos for, getting people to stay on YouTube and watch stuff and watch ads. And that's what YouTube, YouTube wants people to be on YouTube 24 seven. And if you could yeah. be the catalyst to mm-hmm. getting someone to log into YouTube and watch not only your videos, but a lot of other videos as well, then you get credit for that as well, as far as your ranking and, uh, and, and, and cachet within the, yep. the YouTube world. Yeah. Just think about it. YouTube's a company and they want to make money. So oh, that that is something that I think about and like decisions about, you know, like when I'm making those, trying to make a decision about something new, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, does this help YouTube achieve their goals? Um, then, then do that, you know, just think, just kind of think about it from YouTube's perspective too, and not just, don't just look at it as a distribution point. I think that can help strate- strategy wise. And a perfect example you were saying about how the algorithm works, you know, I've, I, I launched the the Indie Film Hustle YouTube channel back when I launched Indie Film Hustle, which was almost a little bit over two and a half years ago. But I really never took it very seriously because I just didn't have the time nor the content really to be putting stuff up. I put some stuff up here and there. But what I decided to do is just start popping up the my podcast as literally a throwaway. Like just like, mm-hmm. let me just put it. It's YouTube. Who's going to listen to podcasts on YouTube? Like it didn't make any sense to me. Um, but I just kept popping them out. And slowly but surely, people started listening. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just started to grow and grow and grow. And because I'm a maniac and produce so much content, um, I ended up having close to 300 videos 
uh, within the in the last two years, I created 300 videos, all key termed out. Everyone talking about filmmaking. You know, mm-hmm. I had a closed caption, and I s- slowly started to see it grow. The subscriber count started going and going and getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. And as uh, you said this before when we've spoken, the first 10,000 is the toughest. Yeah, that's a that's a tipping point. I think that's one of the metrics. Like, if you can get to ten thousand subscribers, mm-hmm. things get easier. And I have been watching your stats because you got to twelve thousand super fast. Yeah, I <laughs> after got, that, you know, like once in a I week broke, or so. Yeah, when I broke ten thousand subscribers, for whatever reason, now I'm at twelve thousand, and it trust me, it did not take me a week or two to get to twelve to two thousand. The first two thousand. Um, yeah. So like, yeah. It, usually, you know, I think you'll get to. A hundred thousand way faster than you got to ten thousand. Uh, then people uh, people usually do. That's that would be insane. I would I would love your 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 uh your your content schedule is a little different. Your your your, your uh strategy up to this point has been a little different than a traditional YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. But normally people that kind of do it by the established book, you know, by the established current guidelines on YouTube. Mm-hmm. They can usually get from 10,000 to 100,000 in the same amount of time it took them to get to 10,000. Wow. That's that's pretty insane. Yeah. Um and then and you've you've been looking at my YouTube channel and you've been seeing mm-hmm. all the analytics and how it's growing. Um and the second I changed to a a more a strict uh we, a daily or weekly schedule. So I do three shows a week. Um nonstop, which is the director series, the Indie Film Hustle um, Film School. And then the podcast, and those mm-hmm. are three that are are, are the the bedrock of the channel. Yep. But then I throw extras in, like I'll throw in a Monday IFH TV episode, or or I'll throw a, an, an extra podcast I never uploaded on a Friday or Saturday just for bonus. Is that mm-hmm. a good thing to do like that, or does it matter? totally? Yeah, because I'm you know, I guess it's you know we've been talking about your YouTube channel mm-hmm. <laughs> like yes. off, off the record, but yes. so yeah, I, I just had to look at your stats again, but you're. Your watch time has quadrupled since October. Is it, over the last twenty eight days, it's quadrupled, which is amazing. That's pretty insane. <laughs> yeah, because you went, you were averaging around. Um, let's see, let's let's. Oh, sorry. No, no, you, no. You, you know, it's easy to get to get me distracted once we start talking about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, but it looks like you're. Yeah, yeah. You, it's quadrupled in views and watch time over the last twenty eight days. So right. that's that's pretty amazing growth. Yeah, it is. It's it's pretty it's pretty insane, and it's and it seems to be getting bigger and bigger. So it, it's for for people listening, understand that. I mean, it took me two years just to even get close to ten thousand subscribers, mm-hmm. but I didn't really, I wasn't really feeding it either. Um, right. So that's why I think you'll get to a hundred really fast because I'm feeding definitely, a lot. definitely in less than two years. Yeah, I'm feeding it pretty 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 regularly now, and it's becoming now its own thing. So, you know, within mm-hmm. the ecosystem of Indie Film Hustle, I have multiple platforms that I'm r- trying to share the message with. Uh, and that's the thing that, you know, again, why I wanted to have you on the show is to show filmmakers that you can do that for your own production company, for your own shows that you want to create, your own channels. This is, this is the, this is, there's, it's possible. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Without question. So I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests, sir. So prepare yourself. Sure. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business or into YouTube today? This is actually something I've been thinking a lot about lately. In in YouTube, like I, I'm just like feeling the move towards series as opposed to like standalone movies a lot. Mm-hmm. Like if you're looking at how people are consuming things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think – YouTube would be a great place. I still think it's a great place to do web series. There's been like several web series that have gone to like broadcast series that were started on YouTube. Um, But I would look at really, I would look at YouTube first and foremost as a place to like cultivate that community and get them interested in you as a filmmaker or in interested in your, your crew of filmmaker people, your production company or whatever, I would like get them interested behind the scenes because there is a big audience for behind the scenes content Mm -hmm. on, on YouTube, but then figure out a way to maybe your channel has like a behind the scenes section or maybe it has, um, a, a, a section for the actual show that you're releasing. I mean, you could still, you could still build up an audience if they, if you can use YouTube to build a relationship with you, and within your niche, then I think you can move that audience really successfully to a feature film or to a series. 
Can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Um, man, you've mentioned it before, but it's The War of Art. Yes. Yes. By War. far. And it's also the book I've given to the most people. It's such an amazing book. It's, it's, it's <laughs> like such the, an amazing book. And it's a great book to go back to whenever you're questioning the grind. Yes. <laughs> you know, you just got to because you just got to lean in and do it and see what the, happens. The resistance, the resistance. Yeah. Uh, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? I think what I'm I think uh, the big thing I'm trying to crystallize this down into a lesson, mm. but I just when I started, you know, I didn't understand how money or business worked at all. You know, I wasn't, I was raised like with, I was raised like really poor. So it was like, for me, it was like, you go to a job, you punch the clock, you get the insurance and you get this amount of money and you budget everything around that. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. However many years later, you do that for 30 years. Yeah. 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 So, (laughs) and I just don't think that's like viable for people anymore. So like my relationship to money had to like definitely change. And I'm not like the type of person that likes to like, you know, I don't even really spend that much or buy that much stuff. But the idea of this is kind of getting to weird stuff, but Go for it. money is like a river that needs to flow rather sure. than something that you collect and put somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like this entirely different relationship to money, which I don't know if I can crystallize that down into a lesson. I just feel like I was really scammed <laughs> as a kid for never <laughs> being like taught about how adults think about money. No, you, you know what? It's it's very interesting you say that because I do believe it's very similarly the same way where you, you know, it, it, money is like a river. It needs to flow uh, and keep moving because if you just stack it in a corner, it does nothing for you. Right. Uh, in or one way, I'm sorry? <laughs> or for any, it doesn't do anyone else any good either. That's the other thing. So if you're creating something that is helping people or at least having your money work for you in one way, shape or form, whether that be investments, whether that be creating product, uh, you know, creating content, something that's moving forward, I think is uh, is extremely beneficial. We have gone down more of the metaphysical road now. Uh, yeah, like you know, I never would have expected. It's the it's the uh, the yoga community that has like it's changed my perspective on a lot of things. You're getting soft, sir. You're getting yep. soft. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now, um, what are three of your favorite films of all time? All right. I got to go for The Godfather. Okay. Two. <laughs> Part two. two. Part two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, um, man, this is this is always a hard one. Chunking Express was a oh, highly impossible so movie for yes. me. And then uh, Raging Bull. Okay. Good Good choices. Or good choices. Uh, and where can people find you and uh, your many worlds that you have created? Yeah, well, I have a blog at ChristopherSharp.com uh, that is at least a good jumping off point for all the other stuff. And I also have a, a book in Amazon called YouTube Black Book mm-hmm. that kind of goes in more detail about the whole story of us doing that. I mean, it's got some good practical tips, but it also gets into the story of starting all these channels and stuff. So mm-hmm. it, could be, it could be interesting if you would like to lo- know a little bit more. And then what are the, uh, and what are the channels, uh, Yoga with Adrian? Yeah, Yoga with Adrian and then Hila Cooking, and that's spelled Mm H-I-L-A-H, Cooking. And uh, I'll put all the links to all of his – his creations uh in the in the show notes chris man thank you so much yeah, for, thank for you. being it's fun. been fun it's been I'm a- excited to see what happens with your youtube channel <laughs> me too sir me too thanks again brother i told you this episode would not disappoint there is so much information in this episode i hope you guys listen to it two or three times and take notes chris literally brain dumped in this episode so thank you so much chris for sharing all of your knowledge i truly truly appreciate it and thank you so much for helping me on my channel and helping me my channel grow as much as it has over the course of the last uh, few months as well. So the stuff works, guys. The stuff he's talking about in this episode and in his book really do work. Uh, and I am a, a uh, proof of the pudding, if you will. So if you want to get links to anything we talked about, including his book, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 227. And guys, thanks again for all the great comments and emails and messages about the uh, the trailer for On the Corner of Ego and Desire. Uh, it's been kind of overwhelming how well it's being received. We're almost at 20,000 views among all of our social media outlets. 
uh, for the trailer, which is sick. It's crazy that, you know, uh, we've been able to do that so far. So thank you so much. If you like it on Facebook, please share it with your friends. Get it out there as much as possible. I really want to get this. Uh, I want to get this little movie blown up as as much as humanly possible and get it out to filmmakers who I know are going to enjoy this. And again, coming in the next few weeks and months, I'm going to be going, I'm going to be doing special series of episodes discussing the making of it, um, how we were able to put the whole thing together, uh, some of the technical information. We're going to be bringing on guests that worked on it with me so we can kind of really break down this process. And then months and months from now, uh, we'll probably put together a detailed uh, course on how we were able to put the whole thing together for the uh, Master Circle as well. So as always, keep the hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.